Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Fast Talkers as we take a perusal around the paddock and I talk to some of my fellow journalists about all things Formula One and I'm delighted to say I have a stellar cast lined up for you today. We have uh, Noemi de Miguel from Movistar. Hello Noemi, have you had fun uh, covering Silverstone? Yes, uh, it was pretty amazing. Do you know what happened? It was a big drama and the you know, but uh, obviously I can't uh, forget to, to send a message to all that amazing supporters that every single year we met here on the Silverstone and, and we missed them a lot, a lot. Uh, and I, I think Louis missed them a lot as well. <laughs> yeah, it was really sad times not to be able to be there for a start, not to be able to see everybody, but there we go. Um, Right, next up, we have from Build in Germany, uh, Lenny Wamke. Lenny, it's lovely to see you. Hello from Berlin, happy to be here. What's it been like in Berlin under these weird COVID times? Oh, well, difficult, difficult, honestly. So I covered the first few races uh, trackside, that was more fun, but for Silverstone and for Spain, the, the upcoming three we were having on the second stint, uh, we decided not to go because we didn't like the Silverstone press room that much because it's only the small window to see out on the track. And uh, therefore we decided as the paddock is not open, it might be also possible to stay in Berlin. And for me, it's a completely new experience because usually, you know, we meet trackside in the paddock or I see all you guys in the media room, but this was my first race actually to fully cover from, from Berlin, from our office. And it was strange. I'm happy to be out again whenever it's possible and meet all you guys in person again. Yeah, it's not been quite the same, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and finally, we have Abhishek Takla from India, uh, writes for Midday and Reuters. And Abhishek, I mean, India's been in lockdown now for quite some time. Is it, I mean, have you got bored of your own four walls, even if they are beautiful? Uh, yes, we've been in lockdown for about four months now. Um, so it's, it's been a bit frustrating, to be honest. Uh, it's good to have the F1 season start off again, but I'd obviously much rather be covering the races from the racetrack than sitting at home. Yeah, I think you're not alone with that. We all feel the same way. Uh, right, let's get chatting. And the first thing we have to talk about, obviously, as Noemi signalled, was Silverstone. What a bizarre race. I mean, it was dull to say the least, almost all the way through. And then all of a sudden, game on right at the end. Um, Lenny, what were your thoughts um, on, on what was going on? Well, uh, I finished my report mainly, was just waiting for the race to end. It was all prepared. So we discussed a quick headline for the website. And yeah, in the last lap, I had to start all over again. So that was, that was <laughs> as you said, the rest was pretty dull. And we were discussing a potential headline. We were looking at the misery of Sebastian again from a German side of view and then, well, Things changed and we had a lot of fun and a very funny evening covering uh, this, this perfect situation of the first three wheel victory of Lewis and um, that was good. We needed that, I think, to, to get an entertaining report for the next day. See, this is where I think now, Omi, we have the best world because we react to what is happening at the time, whereas written journalists like Abhishek and, and Lenny and all of the guys have to rip up everything they've been working on and, and start again. What was it like for you being actually at Silverstone? How much were you able to see what was happening? Uh, uh, imagine, you, you, you know exactly where we are and wait until the end of the race. Yes, in front of a television, as everybody is doing, of all the supporters now from home, uh, any other way to watch the race, but uh, taking notes, yes, writing, writing down, and, and suddenly it was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, all the drivers are coming to the pen and I don't know exactly uh, what's happening with many of them, you know, because you are focused as the, yeah, on the main lines, on the high lines, on the, what is happening with Luis Valtteri or Carlos as well. But, oh my God, it was actually, when I was speaking with Luis at the beginning, you know, in your mind, you create a quick, yeah, image of what was happening. And I told him, okay, congratulations, uh, such a good driving as well. Uh, but Luis, you have been so lucky today. And he told me, do you think so? I think I was unlucky. And yeah, I, I, I told him fair enough because actually he got the finish line in a three wheeled car and how to deal with that. And knowing that Max was just chasing them, him, and this was, okay, okay, fair enough. 
I agree. <laughs> but it was crazy, you know. It was truly a crazy end to the race. Abhishek, I mean, from your point of view, three drivers all suffering a puncture and, and Lewis managing to finish the race pretty much on, on three wheels. One of the most extraordinary endings to a race that you know of? Uh, definitely one of the most exciting, I would say, because I was sort of all like, like Lenny pretty much, you know, sort of typing up my report, leaving blank spaces for the quotes and stuff. And then suddenly uh, my dad was watching with me and he goes like, that's Hamilton. That's Ham I'm like, what? <laughs> Uh, so it was, it was pretty exciting. I mean, I can remember a couple more exciting ones off the top of my head. Um, obviously, you had um, Nürburgring in 2005 with Kimi. Um, and you had, obviously, uh, that was in, this was another Hamilton one where you had the 2008 Brazilian Grand Prix on the last lap. And that had the added spice of being a title decider. But uh, this obviously ranked, you know, I think up there in terms of as far as dramatic finishes go. Uh, so what do you reckon, guys? Um, Lenny, dramatic finishes. Have you seen better? Have you experienced better or just heard of better? Well, in terms of racing on three wheels, it might have been the best one. But, uh, <laughs> apart from that, yeah, I mean, we have, we have, we've had some dramatic endings, of course. I remember the, the, uh, the Silver Arrows colliding in 215 in Austria. That was pretty harsh, I think, in the, one of the last corners and then driving both pretty damaged cars around the finish line. And then they, they were fighting verbally afterwards who was uh, who was the guy who was to blame on this one that was fun uh, but i've never seen a driver cross the finish line on on three wheels so that was that was kind of cool Do you know what, it reminded me a little bit of baku when alonso suffered his failure and had to try and get the car back but that wasn't the end of a race it wasn't you know going for a huge amount of points or a race win it was just incredible to watch him on three wheels try and get that car around what is a challenging circuit to drive around with an injured car in Baku but knowing me the first failure was Carlos Sainz now he's your home man he's the guy that you're always cheering on it that's going to be hard for you to for you to watch and then he ends up you know really suffering out of everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we were just speaking about the, uh, the notes you prefer to do the interviews at, at the end of the race. And I was speaking, yeah, it's like the start because he did again a brilliant, a brilliant start of the race. And uh, okay, the pits were very decent in time uh, for McLaren, which is uh, something new. And oh my God, it was when we were running fifth. And I, I think that he deserves more points than he has scored at the moment. And it's like, you, you sometimes you need more than give him a hug, yeah? And try to, okay, it's gonna be better, it's gonna get better for you. Because it's, it's so tough to try to stay in his mind because it's really, oh, bad luck, you know. It, it, it's the same for all the drivers. And um, actually, uh, Pirelli is, is still investigating what happened because obviously it could be any kind of link with the debris, but it's not only that the cause of uh, three different uh, inflections no, of, of, of tires and the same one on the same, is different corners around the circuit. So, uh, and, and breaking news, kind of breaking news because he, yeah, they rescheduled the test of 2021 tires to the next Grand Prix in Barcelona, but no, the, the mm -hmm. test of the 2021 tires here in Silverstone. And, and I think mm -hmm. it makes sense. Yeah, Lenny? Yeah, well, I was surprised to hear that. I didn't know that until now. So yeah, maybe it's a good idea, as Naomi said. So if they need to find out something about the next tires, better do it quickly on a track that they worked on. So yeah, makes sense. Uh, I think it's fair to say when there are three drivers, including the likes of Lewis Hamilton, having been affected, that questions will be asked and, and Pirelli or whatever happened at the circuit, um, they'll have to find some answers pretty quickly. Uh, Lenny, it, it does help when someone like Lewis is involved in this situation, I'm assuming. The, the yeah, race of the deciding moment, although the same guy won, there was on front, but 
those were the pictures that were on every news show after the race. And uh, if it's a Pirelli tire, then Pirelli needs to come up with the answers. I found it interesting. I've seen the tweet from, from Alberto Fabrega, our, our colleague, uh, after the race, he went on a track walk and he found some sharp metal pieces on the track and some debris maybe from, from Kimi's front wing or whatever they were from. But that looks suspicious, actually. So that might be the, the reason already that the tires failed. If, if this gets confirmed, then it would be a good explanation because what Alberto showed in the picture on Twitter, that looked pretty difficult for, for a tire. Yeah, I think I saw those pictures as well, and it certainly raised some questions. Kimi's failure of his front wing could have been a problem, although we think that was maybe enough laps ahead that it shouldn't have affected them. Um, but yeah, a very strange end to a race that needed some needed some excitement. Let's face it, Noemi, it was not the most exciting race in the world when it comes to Silverstone Classics. Yeah, it, it was. Um, and referring to Albert Fabrega is because my, my colleagues have to be on self-isolation and the only place that they can visit is the circuit or the hotel. So yesterday, you know, Albert is, is still trying to look for a, a whatever <laughs> explains what, what happened. Um, and they did the track walk again and find that debris. But um, what I'm not sure, because it was the accident of uh, Kimis was between maggots and Beckett's, but not all the, yeah, the problems with Luis, Carlos and Valtteri were there. I don't know, I, I, I'm still waiting for uh, anything else from Pirelli more, more, to gather more information. It's not the first time we've seen uh, Pirelli problems at Silverstone. Was it 2015, 2016? I can't remember. I think 2013, when the, the drivers threatened to strike at the next race at the Nürburgring if the tyres don't get fixed. That was, that was pretty interesting. My first season I covered as a reporter, so I have that pretty much in mind pretty well because yeah, that was one of the first races I did and uh, that was exciting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, certainly a, a dramatic race for your first race. And Noemi, where was your first race? Oh, 2016. Yes, this is my fifth season. Yeah. We've all got some experience now, haven't we? Abhishek, where was your first? What year were you in? Um, it was Malaysia 2012. And that was another dramatic one with Checo uh, catching Alonso uh, towards the end and then going off on the Inner Salva and then Alonso won. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, it was a really good one. I remember that one very, very vividly. Uh, I got very wet once again. It's a pit, pit report as well, isn't it, Noemi? We just get soaked and the guys up in the press office sit there nice and warm with a cup of tea. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, let's talk about Lewis Hamilton because obviously he is on the verge of taking one of the big records this time. Uh, Lenny, we'll start with you because the record would be Michael Schumacher's all-time win record. And what do people think of Lewis in Germany and how do they see this record important? Yeah, very important. That's, that's the 91 is a number that almost every kid on the streets knows for a Formula One record that stands for Michael. Um, but I think when, when Lewis really stopped fighting for the title against Germans, so first when the relationship to Nico ended and then with obviously Sepp not being in the mix for a world title anymore, he gets more appreciation because, of course, we cheer for the Germans. And since that stopped and he's only racing for the records and against Valtteri, people starting to acknowledge more what he's done. So that made it more easy for us in Germany to accept that he will reach the, the record of Michael and then be fine with that. And I think with moments like on Sunday where you could see that he's even able to, to win a race on three wheels, that uh, it, yeah, it makes it more easy for us to understand that this guy is, is a fucking legend and that he's so good that he deserves the record when he, when he gets it. So I think over the years, people are accepting it way more. If he would have broken the record during the time when he was fighting Nico or Sebastian for titles, then I think it would have been more difficult for us. Noemi's giggling. I could see you were giggling because he used the F word and we're never allowed to use the F word because we're broadcast oh, I'm sorry, media. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a great thing. We don't have to apologise. It's YouTube. We don't care. Okay. We can swear as much as we want. I won't, personally, because I'll probably get into trouble. Uh, I hope I don't get <laughs> fined by the FIA for that. I apologise. I, apologize. I think the chances of you getting fired for, by the FIA for saying the F word very minimal very minimal Abhishek okay. keep it clean now or don't whatever you prefer but um yeah big deal uh, the 91 record it is and and much like in Germany in India Michael Schumacher was you know the, the the man who sort of brought Formula One into our households because when we started watching Formula One um 
you know, Michael Schumacher was the driver to beat. So he was very much the household name. Even today, a lot of people may not know any other F1 driver, but they definitely know who Michael Schumacher is. Um, and, and now Lewis Hamilton comes along and then he's sort of, he's threatening to beat not just the win record, but also the titles, uh, equal the number of titles and everything. So, yeah, so he is, it is a pretty big deal out here as well. Uh, however, I have to say that Lewis, I suppose it's, it's the case with fans everywhere in Lewis. He's a bit of a polarizing figure. You know, some people really love him. Some people don't like him at all. And that's pretty much the case here in India as well. I mean, he is just as polarizing here, I suppose, as he is anywhere else in the world. But certainly nobody can deny that, you know, he's bloody good. <laughs> like it. Keeping it clean. Bloody good is fine. <laughs> just. <laughs> no, Emmy. Um, I, I consider that when someone likes to someone and not to and dislike to others it's, it's perfect yeah because uh, you are creating an opinion around you and uh, is the character of Louis but for me as no doubts about his uh, record man and he's so ambitious and he's so hungry of victories and still to win and look at looking at a future with more and more Formula One, because I, I, I'm so, I don't know, it's strange for me, it's so weird when every time people is saying, at least in Spain, could be in Spain, that, oh no, he's gonna take a, a year, uh, but for recording maybe uh, music or whatever, or a year off? I, I think it's not in the, in the Louis mind to be a year off now in this moment, uh, because he, I, I consider that he wants to be the best ever. And it's, I, I think that he deal with every single race to get it. And it's so simple. Yeah, Abhishek, did you want to come in? Yeah, no, I was just, I was just sort of going to say, um, sort of, you know, the, the fact that Michael Schumacher being the benchmark and Lewis beating that record, uh, just sort of add color to what I was saying earlier. I mean, I remember sitting in the grandstands at the 2011 Indian Grand Prix. And, um, you know, there was this, it was a big deal. It was our first race and everything. So a lot of people who showed up, uh, showed up to be seen at the race rather than, you know, actually being fans. Uh, there was a lady sat next to me and she says to me, uh, you know, uh, can, you point, can you point Michael Schumacher out to me when he drives fast? So, you know, that's what I mean by he was such a household name. And so, um, and, and Lewis is as well, because he's obviously um, now challenging Schumacher's records, but also Lewis, remember, has been to India a few times as well, um, back when he was with McLaren and for, for Vodafone sponsor events. And he's done, he's done a bit of charity work here as well. So, you know, so he, he, he is pretty well known here. And yeah, it is a big deal. Oh, how we miss coming to India wasn't the right time, wasn't necessarily the right place, but it's a fantastic place to, to take F1. And at least this year, the benefit of coronavirus being around us, that we're going to some phenomenal circuits that we would never have thought of going to before. We've got Portimao on the list. Who knew? Three races now in Italy with Mugello as one of them. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good time for Formula One, even though it's a horrible time for Formula One. Lenny, it is important that, you know, Germany back on the calendar, for example, that's got to be good for you guys. Yeah, and on, on the Nürburgring, so that was something we wouldn't expect at the beginning of the year, and it was, for me, it was quite surprising because uh, we, went, we were there the last time, 2.13, and now I even had to look up on my phone if I still have the contacts from all the guys at the Nürburgring, because mainly I didn't meet them for quite some time there, because they, they had money issues for, for a, lot of, a lot of time, though they were really not on the on the map anymore for any Formula One race, but um, the reason they, they got into the mix was because they, with the politicians involved around there at the track, see the possibility to bring fans back. And I don't know if you guys uh, witnessed it during this race weekend, but on the next weekend, we will have the first event at the Nürburgring, the old timer Grand Prix that they're doing there every year, and there will be fans allowed there. Mm -hmm. So there will be three grandstands open and there will be up to three to 5,000 spectators allowed with a special concept that they, involve, they are all involved in, the politicians, uh, uh, the track and everybody. So. So they came up with a solution already to bring the, the fans back for the next race event. So it's only the old timer Grand Prix, it's not a Formula One race. But if this works, it's a big step for having spectators back when we're coming to the Nürburgring with Formula One. So that could be a really cool idea that we could see some fans on the grandstands 
um, for the German race or the Eiffel race as it's officially called. But yeah, we're happy to have you guys all over here if that works. Party, party in Germany. I love the idea. Noemi, where are you most excited about going to on this new look calendar? Ah, uh, because you don't have data, right? We were yes celebrating that in Imola, there will be only one free practice for the teams. That makes yet to shake the competition, trying to to see something different and to visit. You know, I love Italy, a part of Formula One, so it's that very good place. Yes, yes to visit and yes to be. But uh, I knew Mugello, uh, I thought it was like four years ago for a MotoGP Grand Prix. And it's an amazing place, amazing circuit. Uh, people say that it's not uh, the best for a Formula One because it's so um, complicated for overtaking. But the uphills, downhills is amazing, the environment, and uh, it's, it's a little bit in different places. Every of the circuits, at least in, this, uh, in uh, Europe, but you know, at least we have a competition and we have new circuits and trying to, to look for something different uh, on the calendar. Abhishek, have you got a favorite that stands out for you this season? Sorry? I think, oh, sorry. The, uh, I, th I think the return to Imola is something I'm very excited about. Um, I, I, won't, I won't get to go, uh, but. Uh, that's that's one I'm really looking forward to. It's a track I like, and um, uh, the last time, obviously, Formula One race there was 2006, and I'm really keen to see how these uh, how these new high downforce cars go around there because uh, you know, especially through that downhill bit, the, the left hander Piratella, I think it's called, the blind left hander that goes downhill. Uh, it should be it should be pretty exciting. Yeah, th this whole new format has just been released by the FAA. They've told us how it's going to work. There'll be one 90-minute practice, as you say, um, that will take place on the Saturday, then qualifying, and then the race on the Sunday. What do you think? Is this the way forward for Formula One? Is it good for the drivers? Is it bad for TV, Noemi? Because presumably that's one less day of ratings that people have got to be able to watch. But if... That means we have uh, a better show on the track on Sunday, uh, which is the most important yeah, day. I, I think that televisions yeah, can't complain about it because uh, we are trying to check, uh, and I think Liberty Media is trying to check different ways to improve the, the show. Uh, and um, while the new regulation comes, it's a good way to try and to test how to get it and how to deal with. Because, you know, um, you can broadcast 90 minutes for free practice, one 90 minutes for free practice too, but it, it's, there is nothing happening because sometimes, you know, all the more experts like you are, <laughs> my colleagues, but sometimes I'm looking at the free practice one and two, and at the end of the day, I don't know what was really happening on the track because is the teams gathering information for preparing the the free practice three the qualifying and the race but you don't really got good information or, or something really interesting to broadcast then the main part for me is uh, all the my, my highlights on the circuit is on thursday speaking with the drivers getting the the interviews uh saturday on, on qualifying and sunday so i think that it's a good deal also for television. Well, I see the potential danger that only the, the stronger teams might benefit from that because they have the better engineers, they have more people at, back at home in the factories who are faster than in setting up the cars. So we might have the problem here that if you only have one practice and you have a smaller team with less guys and less data, less computers available to your help, then it might be the case that you need longer to set up your car for a fast lap for qualifying and that might see even a bigger gap between the top teams and the small teams because the top teams would be able to get a good setup in in the in the less time they have rather than compared to the small teams who don't have all the all the people that they may need so we have to be careful when putting that in and I, I would love to have more good show of course for the formula one that the smaller teams don't have a much bigger gap to the big ones when it comes to to this regularly so we have to see how the small teams can adapt to that that might be the biggest problem that we're getting with this style in Imola. I, I think personally, uh, I, I get I get Lenny's point, but you know I think we've seen in the past where you know we've had limited practice running, uh, races tend to throw up more of a 
that, that tends to be a bit more unpredictability in the races. Uh, I mean, I get his point where, you know, bigger teams will be able to crunch whatever limited data they have fast and make changes fast and might widen the gap between uh, the midfield and the top runners. Um, but even if you get, you know, a great show between the top three teams, you know, who, who all have sort of comparable capabilities, uh, I think that would make for a very exciting Sunday. Of course, we don't know how the circuit promoters would, uh, would feel about, you know, uh, the, 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 the action on track being limited, so. Yeah, the, I think there's a lot of questions, but I'm glad that they are going to try it out because when we got the new calendar, it was like, oh, hang on a minute. I thought we were condensing the weekend and now we're not. And certainly when it comes to the guys on the road, I have to say for you, Noemi, I mean, it's fairly relentless. And, you know, you go from the first three races, now you have two at Silverstone and then back to Spain. And it, it, there's no sort of gap built in. And if you're working as one of the teams, I mean, this first, you know, from, from July through to September, it's hard. Uh, I think that is uh, a unique season, a uh, unique way of, of working for the teams and is the only way in which they accept this calendar. It's, it's, I think that everyone on the Formula One world in, on the circus is, is trying to, yes, to put everything together and trying to make the competition survive, try to get uh, a complete uh, world, world championship because it's, it's the main goal for everybody. You know, it is, you, you don't even think a lot about how exhaustive it is to get three races, then a week up, uh, and then another three races, and you really don't know where is going to be the end of the, of the calendar, the end of the season, because the goal is to get the championship lifts, you know, and, and so... Um, obviously, and, and I listened to the, the speech and the quote of uh, Andrea Seidel saying that it's not acceptable this kind of calendar in a regular season, but it, this is not a regular season. So we have to adapt ourselves. And, and, and you know, I spoke about my, my crew and my colleagues uh, being on the, on the bubble because I, I came here before the, the new regulations in UK, uh, but they are, I can't say they are happy. Okay, but it's, it's trying to, to be uh, for the competition and to help. And uh, at the beginning, when we got to, we went to the, to the first Grand Prix in Austria, it was so weird. And at the beginning, it was like, okay, everyone with a mask and the social distancing, and you can't listen to the answers of your interviewees when you were speaking and whatever. But, Okay, it's, it's to keep learning by doing, and the, the best thing is the good vibes around the paddock side with the teams and, and the organization of International Federation and the, all the media trying to push as hard as possible to get a good competition and to complete the championship. And the, the, obviously the first great warning was the positive of Checo. But uh, till now, I think that we are doing a very good job it's not perfect, of course. It's, it's, it's not perfect. It's far to be perfect because, you know, that we were speaking about Germany and that amazing possibility of having supporters on the stands. But at the moment, it is what it is. Yeah, as you so say, we just have to get enough. The situation in Spain away. might be the most difficult one, right? That we're facing this season, I think, because for us Germans, we're not even allowed to go to Catalonia at the moment. So. I think that would be the most difficult race for, of all that are coming maybe because the situation in, in Catalonia right around Barcelona would normally say we should not go racing there. I mean, we are obviously now in two weeks, but I think the situation there, you know, me, you know better, must be the most difficult one for, for Formula One, right? But the problem is the, the, the area in which you have more corona going around, we, we can say, uh, is the city center, you know, is the Barcelona. Uh, the area in which the circuit is, is not so complicated as uh, mm. you keep your bubbles and, and you're from the hotel to the circuit, it won't be any problem. But, you know, a lot of, yeah, a, a lot of teams, uh, actually a lot of teams are looking for another accommodation for the Grand Prix week. Yes, trying to be as far as possible from the, from the city. 
um, you know, uh, I think that all the measures, all the safety measures that the International Federation has created are in a good way to get the, the, the goal that is try to keep Formula One safe from uh, Corona. Uh, but it's, I don't know how to be safe actually, but not in Spain, not here in UK, because some of the team members are going home during the Grand Prix, you know, because they are yet living beside the circuit. And, and you can say, okay, it's normal. They try to take advantage of the time that they are just running the, the races and Silverstone to be as much as possible with their families because usually they don't meet their families. But, um, you know, that could be in Portugal, who knows? It, it's so complicated to keep everything under control. But I know that uh, the, the, the organization, the, the circuit, the Spanish Grand Prix organization is trying to work in the better way and working alongside the International Federation to keep all the safety measures and trying to avoid any kind of problems. Because it's, it's, yeah, it's a very bad luck because it's the main focus is close to the circuit, isn't, but it's on the city. Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of people looking for the next couple of weeks after Spain to make sure that A, exemptions mm. for people traveling work and that nobody picks up the virus and then spreads it within the paddock. As we say, Sergio Perez was the first positive case we've had. And you know, I kind of think how unlucky is it for one of the drivers? There's only 20 of them. There's about 4,000 people involved in making Formula One happen. And one of the drivers gets unlucky. Is that bad luck is it coincidence or is it you know that level of person whether it's a team manager team boss or, or a driver they are they're doing more aren't they they're flying around they're in private jets they're going here and there whereas someone like you know i mean you've been at the track now and and just keeping in your bubble so um abhishek do you think do you think it was bad luck or do you think sergio perez shouldn't have uh, and other drivers should not be leaving their bubble so much. Yeah, I, I I think they shouldn't be. I mean, I know I know with Sergio there was a family emergency, um, and and he did take as as Otmar said in the press conference as well. He did take whatever precautions he could. Like he didn't fly commercial, whatever. But I think when you leave the bubble, you expose you risk exposing yourself to to the virus. So I think I think it's important that you know drivers teams. Whoever's involved in Formula One, um, you know, does their bit to sort of keep the bubble intact because ultimately there are lots of, you know, it's 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 a show that supports a lot of livelihoods and uh, you know there is a certain there's that responsibility where you have to keep the show on the road because so many livelihoods depend on it. Um, so yes, I think I think I think the code needs to be tightened up a little bit. Um, you know, it it's a difficult thing to sort of. Um, it's difficult to formulate a code that covers every eventuality because the situation is changing um, so rapidly with this virus. I mean, uh, we were all in Australia and Melbourne, I think, and, and, and look at how things were there and look at how, thing, how, how much more different it is now. So, uh, so yeah, I think, I think it's, it will keep evolving and I think the code will have to evolve along with it. Um, Lenny, I want to come to you, but not to talk about the code. I want to talk to you about Sebastian Vettel. Rather unsurprisingly, he's not having the best time. He's obviously announced that he and Ferrari will be no more at the end of this year. How big is this a story for Build, for the German newspapers, and how bad is it for Formula One in Germany that is not performing so well on track? Yeah, we have two big problems for us in the next year coming. If Seb really leaves, uh, that would be the first one. And the second one is that uh, Formula One will go into pay TV um, exclusively. So there will be no free to air broadcast anymore in Germany as it stands for now. And if these two things happen, then there would be a big blow for the Formula One community in Germany because you could see the, the races on RTL for over 25 years. So everybody knew Sunday RTL, they, was, they were always there, the guys, you know them all. So that was a big blow. And yeah, I would sad not be able to fight for podiums anymore this year. It's it's very difficult because um, a lot of people who are not as involved in Formula One as we are were expecting to see a Ferrari racing up front as they were doing for, for all the time. So you had to explain after the first races why this is really happening. And most of the people who are not familiar with Formula One at all are saying it's his problem. He's bad. He's driving bad. He's driving slow. He's old. So it was a bit of 
explanation necessary even for us as a tabloid to explain that maybe he did some mistakes but this is not only Seb being not uh, not being on the pace anymore likely it's also the car that is not that good and um, for now it was accepted we were lucky to have Nico Hulkenberg back for for the first race there was a cool story a fresh story a new approach something that we really needed to to do stories on other drivers if we wouldn't have Nico this weekend in a Formula One car then I think with Step and his his practice, his qualification, his his race on Sunday would have been the big topic again, and everybody would raise up the questions: What's going on there? What's going on with the car? What's going on with him? So we could say in Germany, from from media perspective, he had a weekend off from us, with not raising all the questions and everything, rather than just focusing on Nico and the drama on Sunday before the race. But yeah, maybe. But if the next weekend is as bad as the first one, we might have another metal discussion again. But um. Yeah, I really hope he stays in the sport. So if, if this racing point option is really happening, then it would be very good for us because we, we need a good German driver on the grid, of course. Noemi? Yeah, the, 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 I think that the worst thing for Seb is that having Charles get him podiums with the same car is so complicated to explain. Yeah, because for... for those who are speaking about that uh, he is old, he is uh, in not in a great shape, he is not able to get as much as Charles is, is getting from that car that is obviously far to be, to be what used to be last season. Uh, but that is the, the, the great yeah, problem. We, we have to, I don't know, because they, for me, obviously, it's not the age, the, the problem for, for Seb. Fernando is coming next season, Kim is still there, Lewis Hamilton, so, and obviously, I, for me, is is a good thing, because I love to compare the new generation of those brave drivers, yeah, so a little bit, yes, joking and respectful, yeah, with the old ones, trying to get as much as possible from the very first race on the championship, and, and to be yeah comparing them with the old drivers <laughs> okay with my excuses <laughs> yeah not a lot <laughs> but um with coming from another formula one with a huge experience uh, so successful drivers as Seb is as Kimi is is a world champions you know uh but uh, i don't know uh lenny i don't know if you have any clue about the, the contract or if it was true that is going to be announced as a racing point driver this week? I was, I was surprised to hear yesterday that Mark Sutton witnessed Seb jumping into the car of Otmar after the first race and they left the track together. <laughs> So, yeah. so that was kind of cool because I didn't know that. I just, uh, Mark Sutton posted it on Instagram that he had his camera ready, unfortunately, but uh, well, these guys maybe went for dinner at Otma's house after the race. We don't know where they went, but um, could be a good, a good uh, moment maybe to to agree finally on some kind of contract. I, my latest info still is, and that's what we wrote, that if he wants to be a racing point driver in 2021, he can do it. And the, the contract is ready. Um, Lawrence Stroll wants him to be a driver next year. But for now, for some reason, he didn't decide to do it. Maybe because he's still dreaming of Red Bull, if anything changes there. But um, from my point of view, we should really go with Racing Point because the, the project that they're having there is kind of interesting and uh, could, be, could be an entertaining uh, team for the next year. So they have the right guys in the background. Uh, Toto Wolf is so smart, he wouldn't invest any money in a project that is not being competitive. So if I would be Seb, I would definitely sign there. Abhishek, is it important for Formula One to try and keep Sebastian Vettel in the sport, four times world champion, or is it time to let him go, do you think? No, I, I personally would love to see Seb continue, to be honest, because I, I do think he has so much more to give. Um, with Ferrari, you know, I, I think that that championship dream that he had with Ferrari following in Michael Schumacher's footsteps and all of that, I think that's went sour a little bit, and I think he needs... Uh, I think he needs a change of scenery and that, that can really revitalize him. Because it's not like he's suddenly forgotten how to drive fast or how to win races or how to win championships. Because, you know, he is a four-time champion. And he's, you know, he's, as, as, as you know, has been touched upon, he's not old. Um, so he's definitely got what it takes. Uh, and I think just as, just as he was sort of revitalized when he made the change from Red Bull to um, Ferrari, I think a change of scenery will do him good. And 
you know, I was just discussing this with a colleague the other day um, about how so much of um, uh, being a Formula One driver is a mental game. I mean, Lewis is thriving right now because he has an environment that's been built uh, for him in which he can thrive and be himself and express himself. Um, if he was still at the Ron Dennis uh, EPR McLaren, I don't think he would have he would have uh, you know thrived as he has now. And I think it's the same for Seb. If you know he moves to a team where he feels loved, where he feels um, appreciated and respected, um, I think I think he'll thrive again. Uh, we're running out of time. We always run out of time. Um, so final question I want to ask each of you is for as we go into this 70th anniversary Silverstone Grand Prix, what's your favourite, I was going to say Silverstone memory, but maybe it should just be favourite F1 memory. I don't know. Yeah, let's do that. Favourite F1 memory that you've experienced, that you've seen, that you've felt. It could be the best burger you've ever eaten in the world, or it could be the moment you stood on a podium or underneath the podium. Um, let's go with Lenny. I managed to sneak in on Nico Rosberg's championship party in Abu Dhabi 2016, and um, that was good fun. Maybe I was something not there. I, would, I, would, <laughs> I, I, I won't go into details because I think it would not be fair. But let's say it was one of the wildest parties I ever witnessed, and it was half the grid was around there because it was the end of the season, and a lot of people had a reason to party. So most of them were just happy the season was ending. And uh, yeah, let's say there was a there was a fun night. So I would go with that. I want uh, so many questions on that I won't ask any of them. But <laughs> Abhishek. <laughs> Um, my memory is not as 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 wild as that one. I I, I would have to I would have to go with my uh, first race and swiping into the paddock for the first time. Um, that was a very proud moment for me. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to go with that. There's a, we call it the plinky plunk machine. I don't know what you guys call it too, but there's a turnstile and you have to show your lanyard to the plinky plunk machine and it, it talks to you. It goes blub blub blub. Um, some people have said it sounds a bit like Leo Sayer's song, but that's a very UK centric thing to say. So I won't labor the points. Um, please, Noemi, rescue me. <laughs> <laughs> For me, uh, that, yeah, the last one, last weekend, the 2020, uh, the first at Silverstone, it's going to be definitely one Grand Prix to remember. Uh, in Silverstone, I remember fairly well, and it, it, I'm not the best, I, I don't have the best memory, the 2007 for Kimi with uh, Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso on the podium with them, with him. And um, obviously, Brazil last season for me was really special, pretty special. So in, in that mix of uh, Silverstone and the Formula One memories, my, yeah, my highlights. No, I mean, you got on the podium with Carlos, didn't you? Did I imagine that? Uh, no, but it, for me, actually, it was the second time on a podium because the first one was, yes, two years before on Mexico. You remember the self podium when they go out the trophy and uh, Daniel Ricciardo get in the podium, but in the middle of the night with nobody else on the track. Uh, so I remember that only the guys from Fox and our queue we're there, so we can, yeah, go to the to the podium and, yeah, and we lift, yeah, uh, the the trophy. And it was Max Verstappen, yes, yeah, giving the the trophy to to Daniel with um, yeah Christian Horner on the photo sol, <laughs> yeah, clapping. <laughs> and I was, love it. Yeah, in that moment, but I never thought that it's gonna be. I thought actually in that moment is going to be the, the first and the last podium for me. No, actually, yeah, last season on Brazil after three hours waiting for a decision. Yeah, Carlos went to the podium and it was his first and no, I'm sure it's, it's going to be the, the, the last one. Uh, uh, but he needs a little bit more of lucky this season, but it, it's still to come, I'm sure. He's doing it. He's always, always working so hard. He's a workaholic. Uh, so it is coming. For sure, it's coming. <laughs> but guys, it's lovely as ever to speak to all of you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and here's to another thrilling Grand Prix at Silverstone and then on to Spain, Noemi. So um, thank you. Take care of yourselves and speak to you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye.